Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Alyssa Frankel. I'm the social media strategist and community manager at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And we are delighted to have you here with us for our Connected Classrooms program. Our speaker today is Holocaust survivor Bob Baer. He'll be sharing his testimony with you for about the next 45 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a chance for our classrooms who are joining us live on air and for people who are watching who aren't in classrooms to ask some questions via the Q&A app. So without further ado, I want to make sure we have as much time as possible to hear from Bob. So, Bob, take it Thank away. you. Well, the first thing I do is want to apologize because I have a terrible accent and there's not a darn thing I can do about it. So you've got to cover through my German accent for the next 45 minutes. What we are having here is a subject which is the Holocaust, which I'm sure you know what that is. I don't think you know what it really means. And the Holocaust for us was a terrible experience. I would like to make a little experiment with you. Now please follow me for a few minutes and you will see what happens. I want all of you in the different classrooms who have brown eyes to stand up. Remain standing until I tell you otherwise. Just stand up if you have brown eyes. Okay, now you did that. Now you followed the rules about the brown eyes. Now I'm going to tell you, not once, not twice, but every day, that people with brown eyes are bad people. You are not deserved to be happy. You were born with brown eyes, and that in our society is a crime. So you look at yourself and you ask yourself, I didn't do anything, I was born that way. Yes, you were. I was born Jewish, and there was nothing I could do about it. And that is what a dictatorship is. They tell you from the top down that you are a bad person for a, a birth certificate, a, a, a religion, whatever it is, you are condemned, condemned to be a bad person. So I want you to get that. Was, that is what the essence of a dictatorship is. Somebody tells you that you are bad and they're not a thing, you, do it. you can protest, you can object, but it makes no difference. That person, in this case the German people, are convinced that Jewish people are bad. Sit down, please. That will give you an idea of what a dictatorship is. So if anybody ever asks, what's a dictator? He does exactly that. He dictates, he tells you whether you like it or not, and you have to live with it. And that's what I had to do. I had to live with it. I want to give you a couple of facts. I am today 92 years old. Why am I going to do this? Because I'm very interested that you absorb what I'm going to tell you. Because it is you who has to carry that message into future life. We won't be around. 20 years from now, I most certainly won't be around. No, we, my other friends, who are survivors of the Holocaust. And then the job rests with you. If you see an injustice, you see something which is wrong, don't go away and say it isn't my problem, because I will tell you my story, and you will see what happens. I was born and raised in Berlin. And I was born in 19... 22, which I already told you, I'm 92 years old, from a very ordinary, normal household. My father was a doctor, my mother was a housewife, and I'm an only child because what I was told when my mother took a look at me, she said, enough is enough, and never had any brothers and sisters. You're supposed to smile now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so I grew up normally, and uh, I want you to raise your hand if you know what the means of mass communication was in the 1920s. Give me two, if you can, or give me just one. What is it? Nobody knows? Well, you disappoint me. How about, how about radio? 
What was a radio existing in the 1920s? The radio? Telegraph. Would have been telegraph as a response. Uh, what? Telegraph as a response from farming. Yeah, that's to not mass communication. That's communication. You're right, but it's not mass communication. There were two. Of them. I'll make it easy on you. One was radio. The other was newspapers. Those were the means of mass communication. And my first memory of the Holocaust was that the radio was blurring the the voice of a speaker whom I didn't see, I just heard about him, and he was saying things which I, at a young age, really didn't understand. I was six, seven years old, I had no idea what he was talking about. He was talking about that all Jews are bad, that the Jews had caused the war, the World War I. The Jews had signed the treaty which condemned Germany, and so it went on and on and on. And I didn't understand. I heard the voice. It was not a pleasant voice, but uh, it was a voice which threatening. You know, you hear people talk when they have a threatening tone of voice, and that's exactly what that guy had. And I got scared. I was only a little kid. So I went to my mother and asked her, what is this? Who is this that he's listening to? And my mother said, oh, don't you worry about it. That's just some German politician who wants to make a name for himself, and you don't have a thing to worry about. We live in a free country. We have not, We are protected by the police, and you just ignore that. If your father wants to listen to it, let him, but don't you pay any attention to it. So what do you do as a young kid? When mom says, don't pay any attention, that's exactly what you do. You don't pay any attention, and I ignored it, and I lived my young life as I was used to. But then, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, this all changed on one lousy, miserable day. Not a week, not a month, and one day. Anybody know what day that was? No, you don't. So I will give it to you. 30 January 1933. So what happened on that day? The German man, Adolf Hitler, I must correct this, he wasn't even German, he was Austrian, but nevertheless, a man with the name of Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. Now, in order to imagine what in that sentence, that one sentence, he became the Chancellor of Germany, you've got to know a little bit about what is the power of a Chancellor. What can a Chancellor do and what can he not do? Well, I'll make it short for you. It's a fact that a chancellor in Germany had unrestricted power. If you want to have an, uh, an idea, equate it, compare it to the President of the United States. A German chancellor had as much power as the President of the United States. The German people were jubilant. The German people thought that was a good thing that Adolf Hitler was elected and he, he did not come into government by revolution. He was legally elected by the people and they uh, voted him into office and there he was on one day. Let me tell you a little bit about that day. Germans launched a big torch march. You know what a torch march is? That's the one where you have a burning thing in your hand. They marched in saying towards the office where Adolf Hitler had his office and to congratulate him and to praise him and all so forth. And they were singing. They were singing. Germans love to sing. It depends on what they were singing. In this particular case, and put yourself in the shoes of a seven, eight year old kid, when you hear those words, when Jewish blood spurts from our lives, then our lives will be so much better. Analyze that song for one minute and you will see that song indicates that the Germans intend to uh, hurt Jewish people. 
and that's uh, my first impression of what I got, what what my life would be like, and it was frightening. It was not very good. I was very very much upset. But then, then it rained. It rained down with laws. All the laws dedicated to make us feel miserable. There is no way that I can possibly, in a few minutes, tell you how much they hurt us. And it was very easy for them to hurt us. Why? Because they had all the power. You couldn't go to the police. You couldn't go to your congressman. The congressman was in the same pocket. The police was in the same pocket. In, in, the, in the Holocaust Museum, which hopefully you will visit one of those days, is a picture when you come out of the elevator with a policeman, a dog, and a stormtrooper. And these people symbolize the power they had over your lives. There is no judge who can rule you. Has no, there is no Supreme Court which uh, can uh, f make an objective thing. Nothing is there. So what have you got left? Well, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, very little. You had, you got left is your own guts, your own endurance, your own dedication for a poor life, and the most important thing I've forgotten, that's the hope, the hope that things will change. Ladies and gentlemen of my audience, let me tell you, if you lose that, if you lose the word H-O-P-E, you're lost, because that's the only thing you had. The only thing you had what made you determined to survive and to live and to, uh, to, lay, uh, to prosper and so forth. When you, once you lose hope, but we didn't. We always hoped. And as history progressed itself, as the times marches on, it didn't look very much to put our hope in it because the Germans were smart. And the audiences they have were good. And, the, and so we saw a development that uh, is almost unbelievable. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to mentally think about your hometown. I don't know anything about your hometown except, in this case, it's in California. We have one in Ohio. We got a third one. I want you to think about your hometown. And think about your hometown being totally changed overnight. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Let me assume for a minute that you are Catholic religion. And you would find sudden on the place that you used to visit a big sign that says, Catholics are not allowed here. It doesn't matter. I'm using this as an example because for us Jews, it wasn't kind of, it wasn't no example. It was indeed the case that whatever we wanted to do, I don't know what your favorite sport is, and it doesn't matter, but you know what you need to play that sport, whether it's baseball or it's, it's, it's uh, something else. You need some equipment, you need a place. Let me give you an example of my own. I just loved to sing, swim when I was young. So what do you need in order to swim? You need water, not a problem, plenty of water. But you also need a pool. And that pool had a big sign saying, we, are, we do not allow Jews in this pool. There was the door closed. Didn't do anything. They didn't hurt anybody. But suddenly, the Christian users of that pool did not wish to have Jews in the same water. Well, you can say we have a swimming pool at home. No, no, we didn't. That is an American success story to have a pool. This is not very common in Europe and certainly not in Germany. So we had a public bath. We had a public pool. But that public pool also had a big sign saying, no Jews wanted up here. And so you find yourself 
surrounded by hatred, surrounded by people who quote unquote uh, don't like you. That's what the Germans told us every day. You are not liked. And so now let me tell you something about my family. I don't know how many of you are historians. I don't know how much you learn about history. But you know there were two wars in Europe in the, in the 20th century. One was the War of 1914. The other one was the War of 1939. So let's forget about the second one. Let's talk about the 1914. That was long before a dictatorship that was still under the emperor. And my dad volunteered to become a soldier for the emperor's army. And he was very proud of it. He believed that it was the right thing to do. He volunteered. He, became, he was even promoted to become a first lieutenant. He got decorated with the Iron Cross, which all this indicates to you and to me, this is a dedicated person. This is a dedicated man who wished to do good for his fatherland. Well, and tell me how that fatherland thanked my dad. Well, after the war, no problem. He lived in a free country. Come 1933, which I just saying to you, uh, they changed. And so suddenly we were the outcasts. What do you think that does to a man who volunteered to fight, who uh, recognized the possibility that he was saved, uh, that he was killed? He had to count with the uh, millions of people who were killed during World War I. My father could have been one of them. He wasn't. But when later on the Nazis came and said how bad he was, how ugly he was, how he must be eliminated, and they did, that hurt him, that hurt all of us. Because we couldn't believe it, that a country which a couple months before was a democratic country where you were free as anybody, now suddenly you're an outcast, you, you're ugly. You mean, but they went further. They went, for example, in effect, where they where they hurt with symbolic things. How many of you have a passport already? I want to see some hands. Okay, what does a passport signify? That you're an American citizen. If you have an American passport, uh, which I assume you do, you have you're an American citizen because that's where you were born, those are your rights, and so forth. Well, the, we had the same thing. Until in 1934, the Nazis suddenly passed a law that the German Jews are no longer citizens. We were allowed to stay. We became residents. There's a vast difference because a citizen has rights, a resident doesn't. A resident has permission, but not rights. When you could say, it is my right to be have a fair trial, that was not at all under a citizen. A citizen may be subjected to saying, <clears throat> you have a trial, but it doesn't say anything about a fair trial. There is no court you could appeal to. So slowly but surely, you find yourself isolated. You find yourself wondering what the future would bring. Let me tell you something about school. I went to school the first day when the Nazis came to power. And we had a new teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. We had a new teacher who demanded that everybody stand up when the teacher comes, when he comes in the class, and greet him with Heil Hitler. Now, you know, the all, all of you know the Heil Hitler greeting, which is like this, with the heads closed, and you say Heil Hitler. So the teacher wanted to be greeted with this. So, what's the big problem? Well, the big problem is that we had four Jewish kids in that class. And Jews were, of course, not allowed to use the German greeting. Punishable. Don't know how what, what is possible. 
because I never got there. It was punishable if you use the Hitler greeting uh, in class to greet the teacher. So we four kids sat together and wondered what in the world are we going to do? Are we going to stand up and risk that the guy finds out we're Jewish? Or are we going to stay in our seats and let everybody else stand up? Well, I tell you, you're not going to be very proud of me, but we stayed in our seats. We knew that we could find out for a little thing like this in a concentration camp. And we were all of us assume that there were concentration camps. So that was not mentioned exactly what it would be. So we kept in our seats. So you can start again in a second. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so where was I? I was trying to tell you a little bit about our life. So life went from bad to worse. I mean, I can give you hundreds of examples of how they made life miserable. And they were very successful. I told you that uh, we had to turn in our radio. We had to turn our telephone. We were not allowed to buy newspapers. We were not allowed to use public transportation like uh, we, we have a subway in, in uh, Berlin, of course. We had streetcars not allowed to do unless you went to work for the Germans. You couldn't do it. So it was the world was getting smaller and smaller. And I had no idea how this would end. Now I know how it would end. I don't have very much time left to tell you. I hope I've pictured, give you a picture of a life on a dictatorship. In essence, you have no rights, but you have lots of obligations to obey the law. My own life turned a turn for the worse. By 1941, they started to arrest all the Jews and send them into gas chambers. We were, I was very worried that my parents would be the one who were picked up, put in a cattle car, and sent to Auschwitz or one of the killing things. They didn't do that. And the reason they do that is not because we were Jewish or not Jewish, had nothing to do with it. The reason they didn't do it is, is that my father had served in World War I, was a veteran, at the Iron Cross and became an officer. Those things combined persuaded the Nazis to arrest everybody, put them away in a camp someplace, but didn't send them to their death in the concentration camps, which uh, was so customary since 1941 to 1944. So we were arrested, put in a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. It's a country that doesn't exist anymore, called it the Czech Republic today. The, the camp's name was Terezin, T-E-R-I-Z-N, uh, which is the uh, Czech name, and because the camp is located in the Czech Republic, in those days it was Czechoslovakia, but uh, the, uh, the Germans gave it their own name, which is, becomes very, or became very popular, was Theresienstadt, and that's where we wound up. Now, 
in order to have an idea about Theresienstadt, picture a little town of 4,000 people. It's a small village, no matter where it's located. The Germans emptied that village out. All the original inhabitants were evacuated, and the city was empty. And in that space, where 4,000 people lived, they shoved 60,000 people. Now, 60,000 people will not allow you, under any circumstances, any idea of privacy and being alone. I'm sure that most of you would like to be alone sometimes in your life. Whatever reason, whether you're happy or whether you're sad, but sometimes you like to close the door and be alone. That was never granted to us. We were never alone. The room where we slept in, which I cannot demonstrate to you, but we slept 60 people in on the floor. No furniture, no straw, heat, cold, miserable weather, everything. The house, we were in at four rooms. Each one of them had anywhere between 35 and 60 people in it, depending on size. There was no uh, running water, certainly no hot water. There was no toilet facilities, only outhouses, and no washing other than a pump in the backyard, a manual pump we had to use. Let me ask you something. I know you cannot answer easy. How much showers do you take a day? Probably one or two. We could never take a shower. After a while, we all looked filthy. We looked dirty. And that's exactly what they wanted us to look like. Then he would take photographs and say, those are the Jews who live among you. Dirty, uh, horrible, and... Uh, that's that's how you are Jews, and you want to protect them. No German people, you must condemn them. They cannot even, and that's the irony of it, they accuse them for not being clean. Well, give me a break. We had no opportunity to keep clean. We were just like you were. We were desirous. My parents were wonderful people, and, you know, at home, everything was tip-top in speak and span, and everything here was nothing but filth, was nothing but dirt, was nothing but death. People died like flies everywhere. And even though when we were arrested, we uh, tried to save our lives because life was so bad, I saved my parents' lives not physically, but by volunteering for a job which was a military construction site, which was very bad. Now, I'm going to cut a lot short because you guys don't give me enough time. So I will just say that that place where we had to go, where we were drafted to go to build that new construction, uh, was run by an SS lieutenant colonel who was the most cruel Nazis I can remember. He was so cruel that anything he could do to hurt us, he would use. Let me give you one example, which I think, in a retrospect, sounds almost funny. There were days when we had nothing to do. Why didn't we have anything to do? Because this is 1944, the war is going to an end. The construction material to build the guys headquarters didn't come in. The Germans had other problems. They had to go and uh, take care of the wounded, the ammunition. In other words, they had to take care of the war. They didn't have time to build that guy's headquarters. And so subsequently, we had nothing to do. So we said, so what do you do with 200 Jews who had nothing to do? Well, you got an option. You can send them to the barracks and say, why don't you guys relax? for a day, and then we'll continue again to work once the material comes. But not that guy. He would take us in November, December, in the woods with a bucket of cold water, no gloves, and a brush, and he told us, we will wash the trees. We wash the trees until they clean. 
And if they were not completely clean, if he would find any dirt on a tree, we would be punished. And punished we were because I don't care how long you wash a tree. If I want to find something on that tree, I will. So, so did he. And so then we were punished. What does punishment mean? Well, the mildest form of punishment, men standing without clothing all night long, without go allowed to go into the bathroom, outside in a freezing wind. We had PP running down our pants and uh, the PP froze. We had nothing to eat. We had nothing warm. And in this respect, let me by closing out a little story, which to me, to, my, to this day, still makes me weak and sad. Uh, I was outside, it was a December day, it was going towards Christmas 1944, and I was outside in the barracks, in the, on the, on the uh, construction site, and we had nothing to do, we just launched around, and we could, because he didn't keep us busy all day. And then I saw something, then I saw something, which to you may find stupid or silly, or sad, I don't know. I saw one of the barracks which was almost finished. And in, the, in that barracks they had light. And I was able to look through the window. You know, of course the barracks were not for us, they were for the SS. And uh, that barracks was in. And what I saw in that room through the window is what made me cry. It was a lamp, a standing lamp, an easy chair and a big stove. And I looked at this thing as if it were paradise. Paradise. I was outside, cold, miserable, freezing, sad, unhappy, you name it. And there was, there wasn't anybody in that room. But it was meant for a German and to uh, relax there and I don't know if I'm proud of it or sad of it, I cried. I had tears streaming down my face, which immediately froze because it was so cold. And that to me, if you ever see a place which you wanted to have more than anything in your life, it was that room. I dreamt if I live long enough, can have a room with a light, with an easy chair, and with a stove, that would be my, my happiness would be unimaginable. That's how low we sank. We couldn't think, I mean, let's say not we, I couldn't think any further than that picture of the room. I didn't dream about fancy things, car, house, you name it, nothing. Just a warm room and a roof over your head. So that gives you a picture of the thing. We survived Theresienstadt because the Russians were coming. We, the camp was evacuated back to Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic. And we returned in February of 1945 to the base camp. And much to my happiness, my parents were still alive. Not very well health-wise, but they were alive. They were not sent away because my father was a veteran and he survived. They died shortly after the war. But I regret, and that was February 1945. And on the 5th of May, the Russian army came and liberated our camp. And that, ladies and gentlemen, essentially is my story. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. And you better, because otherwise I didn't do a good job. All right, we're going to go first to Mission Viejo High School in California. Um, hello, my name is Sabrina. I go to Mission Viejo High School. And my question is, um, did you make any friends or experience any events that made your experience more bearable? She wants to know if you made any friends or had any experiences that made your experience more bearable. Friends where? At the camp. In In the camp. Uh, yeah, I had one friend 
a 16-year-old girl, and I really, this is almost ridiculous under the circumstances, I really fell in love with her. She was sweet, she was nice, she gave me a souvenir which I still carry around my neck, and uh, about three months after I met her, I was deeply attached to her. Luckily, she spoke German because I didn't speak Czech. Luckily, we uh, had a few months together, and then one day she was gone, sent to Auschwitz, and all I have of her today is a certificate that she was gassed. And uh, that was the only real friend I had. Because, let me tell you something, you may think we had so much in, to suffer together. When you suffer together, you become friends. Let me show, tell you something. You are young. You've got your whole life ahead of you. That, that uh, as they say in German, den Zahn kannst du gleich ziehen lassen, which means you can pull that tooth right away. Being together, suffering the same thing, does not make you nice people. To the contrary. A lot of people get mean, unhappy, frustrated, and that doesn't make very congenial people. So it was very difficult to have friends there who had the same experience. We all had the same experience, some worse, some better, but uh, friends, everybody was out for himself. The big word in our lives was survival. We wanted to survive, and that's what kept me awake and alive. Thank you. We're going to go next to Village Academy Schools in Ohio. Yeah, make sure you're in. Hi. Hi. I'm Monica. I'm from Village Academy. My great grandparents also were at Jerusalem. God before they were sent to Auschwitz. Thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> um, her her great grandparents were also in Theresienstadt before they were sent to Auschwitz. Did he survive? No. No? He died in Theresienstadt? No, they were sent to Auschwitz and then died. Oh, he, he was one of those where they want to empty the camp and send all the people to Auschwitz. Yeah, that's really tragic. Yeah. Okay, so my question for you is, what do you want us to teach others about the Holocaust? What do you want them to teach others about the Holocaust? Just about what I did know. Those who still live uh, can talk about their experience. People are young, like you are. You, if you heard the words, I think the basic message for the Holocaust, you can tell, you can talk for hours. But the basic message is that when you see, you see some injustice in this world, don't go away and think that this isn't my problem. You know, it's a tendency we all have to go away and say, we got enough problems, I don't need another problem. But that's not the right thing to do. You may not be able to do anything physically, but you may be able to talk to somebody who can help, you may be able to talk to the person himself and say, why do you do this? And uh, if it's dangerous, call a policeman. But do something. Just don't say, that's not my problem. I'm going to go away and you sort it out. That's a, that's a basic message. The Holocaust is too important and too, ter too tragic to ignore it because most people don't even know what the Holocaust is. It gives, there are people who deny the Holocaust, saying it never took place. You have that too. And uh, so there is a mission you can do. If somebody said, oh, they didn't kill six million Jews, well, you can tell them, go visit the Holocaust Museum. So you have one in California too. And, uh, Okay? Yeah. You're good. I'm clumped in again. Yeah. So uh, the, the basic idea is do something. It may be very little, it may be quite a lot, but if you see an injustice, react. Don't escape. Excellent. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Excellent, thank you. We're going to go next to Farmington High School in Minnesota. Hi, my name is Matthew Kelly. Um, I have a question. What kind of advice do you have for like people who have to hide from the government and like government who have like extreme power? What advice do you have for people who have to hide from their governments when their governments have extreme power? Hide. Hide. Well, that's it. That's uh, if they really need to hide. You need to understand, why was hiding so important? It isn't just because you want to save your life. That's the most important. But hiding meant a lot more. Hiding during this time. Hiding in the years from 1933 to 1945. That's 12 years. Uh, you need a big support. You need to have people who feed you. Uh, people who house you people who take care of you when you sit. And all this in hiding is extremely difficult. So, for example, the people who do the hiding need to be very strong, very dedicated. Because in, in Germany in those days, that was punishable. If you took a Jewish kid and say, I'm going to hide that kid, and that has happened many times. They even have uh, given them a fake religion, so they could say that they're not Jewish. But it took a lot of guts, a lot of courage to hide, because, you see, the German police was very effective. They found you, you know. They even had spies going around. I'm a Jewish refugee. They weren't. They just wanted to say, oh, me too, and whoops, you were arrested. So it took a lot of courage. It was not easy to do. It is not heaven on earth and you are in hiding, except you have to be very careful. I know people in France who never got outside in three years, ever France, since France was occupied. I always stayed in the room. Did you ever read the uh, diary of, the Anne, of Anne Frank? You ought to get it. Check it out in the library. It's a very good book. It's a little girl who uh, was in hiding. What she went through, she wrote a diary. And you will find that very interesting because it does answer some of your questions, what's involved, and how difficult it was to be in hiding. Not only to find somebody who will hide you, but not to be in hiding. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. All right. Bob, we're going to take a question from some of the people who you can't see on there, people who aren't part of the classrooms who are watching along at home. Mm -hmm. And there's someone out there named Isaiah who wants to know, were there any guards in Theresienstadt that were lenient with some of the victims, and did they ever try to help? Were there any guards in Theresienstadt that were lenient, and did they ever did try they to help? What? Lenient. Were they, were they kinder? Did they ever try to help? Oh, try to help. That's a very interesting question. I don't know where you are, or let me give you a brief one. The guards in our camp, there were only three or four uh, German guards there. The rest of a huge number of guards, <clears throat> they were all locals who were hired. In this case, Czechs. They were all Czechs. Now, what you need to understand about those guards is they were Czech nationals working for the Germans. The reason they worked for the Germans is that they needed something to eat, needed a job, and that was the only one they could find. Didn't mean at all that they loved the Germans. Uh, to the contrary, they secretly disliked the Germans very much, but they needed a job, and so they took it. And so these guys would never really harm any of the Jewish prisoners who were also Czechs and Germans and they were they were secretly their allies and so that was not at all the case that they were hurting the prisoners if anybody hurt the prisoners it was the Germans and if there was one guard who did I don't know anything about it 
but basically deep in their heart it is the guards through which we found out what the Germans did with the Jews when they sent them to Auschwitz. We had no idea. Remember, we had no communications whatsoever. But the guards, what the Germans did, and I'll give you an example, what the Germans did, they hired the guards, well, they already hired them. They used the guards to escort the trains from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. And they used them to make sure that the Jews didn't jump off the trains and escape. And those guards, of course, came to Auschwitz, saw the smoke, smelled the air, knew what was going on. And when they noticed that some of the guards were not German, but they were Czechs at the time, they told him secretly, listen, they kill you here, and showed him and explained him. So when the guards came back, who were not Jewish, of course, when the guards came back to the camp, they told their colleagues and friends inside, the Jewish Czechs, what was going on, and said, don't you ever agree to be, and the Germans call that resettlement, don't you ever agree to be resettled? Try to fight this as much as possible. Now, that story I only found out after the war. But uh, that is, when you ask about the guards, that's how we felt in the relationship with us and the guards. Thank you. We're going to go back to the classrooms now. We're going to take another question from Mission VAO High School. Yeah. Hello, I'm Carson. Uh, uh, have you gone back to the camps since the day you were liberated? And if so, what were your feelings then? Have you gone back to the camp since the day you were liberated? Yes, I have. Uh, once. You can do that very easy. There is a, uh, if you ever go to Prague to visit Prague, there's a bus tour you can take to the camp. We took that bus tour. And the camp, we were there, this is 2014, about 2012. The camp is vanishing. The, the government over there is resettling this, and you have practically nothing left of the camp. Because they were not barracks which we had up there. They were ordinary houses. And uh, did you hear me? OK. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I heard you. Thank you. Can, can you tell what your feelings were when you went? Hang on, we need to fix the mic again. Bob, um, um, he wants to know how you felt when you went back to visit. That's what he wants to know next. Mm. What your feelings were about going back. Yeah, are you yep. ready? Yep. Well, we went back there once, and it was a, 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 a trip with very mixed emotions. Uh, it, it, it brought back a lot of memories which I really didn't want to have back. I mean, of course, you can say you didn't have to go. That's true. But it, it, it sort of draws you when you're that close. It was about, what, 75 kilometers and, uh, from Prague, and uh, it was that close. And I said, well, that's the street I walked as a prisoner. Those are the places I ate as a prisoner. So it draws you. Then when you're there, it brings back memories which you just as soon not have. And so it is what I call mixed emotion. You know, on the one hand, it's interesting and, and uh, brings back memory. On the other hand, it is something which you just as soon forget and not remember. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Okay. We're going to go next to Village Academy Schools. All right. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the role of religion was in the concentration camps. Did you abandon your faith, or did you use it as a coping mechanism? She wants to know about your religion while you were in the camp. My, my, I was born with the same religion. There wasn't very much I could do about it, and I certainly wouldn't go. Uh, let me tell you honestly, basically, the question is somewhat inappropriate because we were not religious. 
we have on paper we were Jewish, no question about it. In in, in attitude, in religion, in handling this uh, problem, we were not very Jewish. I think I told the other audience this morning that uh, my parents were first of all they were Germans, secondly they were Germans, and thirdly they were Germans. They loved the country, its culture, its heritage, everything else, except of course the Nazis. And we were growing up, we were, I grew up to, to like German literature, to like the German landscape. They got beautiful castles, they got rivers, they got everything. It was a lot of beautiful things. The only thing that was ugly was the German people in those days. Today, you find a totally German generation. But uh, I don't know if I can answer your question any better. You okay? Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Great. All right, we're going to go now to Farmington High School. Uh, I'm Sarah. I was wondering what your advice is to political leaders um, to make sure that something like this never happens again. What advice would you give to political leaders to make sure that something to like political this leaders? That's a good question. Half of them are throw away. I mean, you know, right off the bat. They're hopeless. When I elect somebody, that's the only way you can I can answer this. Because I don't appoint people. I do nothing. I uh, I go once or twice or every four years and elect. And so what I'm trying to do to elect somebody who reflects the same ideals I have. And whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, it doesn't matter. If he has the same ideals I have, then he's probably going to get my vote, you know. And the advice I give him must be that he, th he thinks the way I do, that he believes in the things I do, that he does something for the things I want him to do something. And that gives them my vote. Now, whether they actually do it when they're in office, that's another question. But um, that's my ideals. I look at my ideals. <clears throat> Let's take a very bad example. Minimum wage. You heard about that? Everybody ought to make a little more money. Now, I would probably not elect somebody who says, I don't believe giving people more money. That's not what I'm here for. Uh, I'm here to save money, and that's not my ideal. I would believe that anybody uh, I, I can in my uh, uh, my state deserves more money. And so there is a congressman who says, "I firmly believe that we need to raise the level of pay." And he would probably get my vote. So I don't know if that answers your question. That's a pretty complicated question. But that's what I'm going by. That I elect people who think like I do. Whether that's right or wrong in somebody else's eyes, that uh, I can't help that. But uh, that's my ideal. So if you run for congressman, I'm going to vote for you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. All right. We're going to take another question from our people who are hanging out who are not visible to us. They want to know if you did or still do have angry feelings towards the Germans. Quite the opposite. Let me give you a two-minute answer on that one. The Germans have tremendously changed. My judgment of the Germans, would you believe, depends on age. When I meet a German who is 92 years old, like I am, I wonder what the guy did during the dictatorship of the Nazis. When I meet somebody your age or older, let's say 35, 40 years, who never even fought in the war, had nothing to do with killing Jews, I am polite to that person, I am nice to that person, if he is nice to me, I do not discriminate against any German who hasn't even lived, or his father or mother hadn't lived, 
during the, those days. That goes back now 75, 80 years. So if somebody was born in that world, he's still too young. But if somebody is has the age of uh, uh, 24 in those days, was born in the 19 teens, then he is a guy who could well have served in the USF. Let me tell you something. I joined the US Army, and the first thing they did with me they sent me back to Germany and to find former Nazis, to interrogate them, arrest them, and so forth. But I was, of course, in American uniform by that time. And uh, I sent there, and you guess how many Nazis there were? The one I came in touch with? None. There were no, 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 nobody was a Nazi. Nobody was a believer in Hitler or anything. So how did they base it on? It's very simple. They base it on directives. They base it on, as they told me many times, we didn't have a choice. For example, just give you one example, a teacher. A teacher in those, in those, in those days, all over Germany, was a federal employee. He wasn't a state employee like it's here, and like it is today. It was a federal employee. And the law came down that all federal employees must be members of the Nazi party. So when the war was over and I asked him if there were any Nazis, of course they said no. They said no, I'm no, no Nazi. I didn't have a choice. <clears throat> I got a, uh, my boss told me you join the party or else you get fired. And when you get fired in Germany in those days, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean just you lose your job. There's much more to it. You get discriminated. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my answer. Thank you. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So we're going to go back to Mission Viejo High School. We seem to have dropped off. They're gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor. I'm uh, Shelby, and my question is: uh, At any point while you were in the camp, did you ever lose both? Can you say that one more time? We didn't uh, hear you. Uh, I'm in the camp. Did you ever like give up hope at any point? She wants to know if you ever gave up hope at any point while you were in the camp. The answer is yes. At the very end, about a, a six, seven months before the war ended and I was liberated, that's when I gave up hope. That's when I, I decided I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be around anymore. <clears throat> Life isn't going to be changed until I learned otherwise and I decided to live. But there was a time when I had lost hope. I was so sick. I had high fever, my clothing was sticking on me and everything, so there was really nothing good. I didn't know how long the war would last. I thought as far as, it, as, far as I knew, the Germans were winning all the time. I didn't know anything about the Battle of Stalingrad when the war turned around. And uh, so to me, it was only the beginning of the war when the Germans won all the time. But I wanted to ask you, may I ask you a personal question? Um, sure. Yes? Yes, sir. Okay. Why didn't you invite me to come to California for a of <laughs> money? I could have paid for one person, and I could have visited beautiful California. <laughs> See, here I'm sitting in old Washington, D.C., talk to you on the screen instead of talking to you personally. If you said, Mr. Bear, come on out here, you're most cordially invited, we'll pay your way. And I, would <laughs> just... <laughs> I wonder if I can say. You're invited. You think about that, right? Yes, I will. Thank you. We're going to take our last question from Village Academy Schools. OK, you're, you're not in. Sure. You have a tall student. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank you for your story, first of all. 
And um, also, you're welcome to come to Ohio whenever you want. <laughs> and uh, my question for you is, what scares you most now? First of all, he says thank you for sharing your testimony. And he says that you're welcome to come to Ohio anytime. Oh, yeah. I lived 40 years in Ohio. <laughs> I lived in Dayton, Ohio, right Patterson Air Force Base, for my half of my life up there. So I'm a, na I'm a neighbor of yours. Where are you? Are you up north in Ohio? Uh, Columbus. In the Columbus area. Near Columbus. Uh, Columbus? Well, we're neighbors practically, 70 miles, and you're in Dayton. Anyway. So his question is, and I think I got your question right, uh, correct me if I didn't, what scares you most now? Is that correct? I, I don't yeah. understand. What, what, uh, thinking about the present day and the situations that we look at, what worries you most now about the world we live in today? What would I do about the world today? What, what, what worries you? What scares you? Oh, what worries me? Practically everything. Uh, I'm worried. I'm worried about the future of our country. I'm worried about the world situation. Just open any day you want the Columbus title in the newspaper you have, and uh, you will find pages and articles of things which uh, the world is not in good shape. I, I don't need to uh, tell this to you. It could have been in worse shape, but it's not in very good shape. There's too much murder, too much killing. I, for example, personally don't dislike me for that. I find it incredible that Americans have the authority to carry a weapon. Some of them concealed, some of them in a restaurant. The other day I read an article that you can carry a, a weapon into a church. Now, those things, you know, I, w I wouldn't say they make me sick, but uh, they worry me because there are too many murders going on and things like that. So I, 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 I'm worried about the country's future. I'm worried about you. Guys, which, who are the future of our country, and uh, I don't know. I don't have any more things to say, which are not already obvious. You know, everybody says, let the international community down. Now, let me talk to you about that. You hear that in, in, in Ukraine, you hear it every, why doesn't the international community do something? You know who the international community is? You. You. You guys who are sitting there. Because that means usually we have to go in there with what they call boots on the ground. And this is you. And sooner or later, we're going to have a draft again. And then you have no choice to go. And <clears throat> that's the point. People use slogans like international community. When you translate this, when you look back, who is behind the international community? That's you and I and everybody else. And so that what worries me. People dump problems on the quote international community, unquote, and don't realize who that is. End of comment. Bob, we're just about out of time. Is there one last thing that you want to say to all of the classrooms? Yeah, I want to go to California. No, that's not what I mean. Uh, no, I want to thank you for listening to me. I mean, this is not an easy subject. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, I, I can't tell from the screen, but I see faces uh, looking at me, then I can sort of see whether they get with it. Well, on the screen, it's difficult. You all look pretty. You all look nice. You all are nice. So I don't know if what I told you today in my old age is something worthwhile to you. Do, you. do you go home and say, you know, I had a really interesting talk to you, blah, blah, blah. So that would make me happy, but of course I won't know that. So I can only hope that I've given you something which you don't get every day. You don't have survivors who've been through this whole 12-year mess. 
as I have. So uh, thank you, good Lord, that you are healthy, that you're good looking, and we'll let go at that. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank you so much for participating today. Bob, the classes, and Google would like to thank you for taking part and for taking the time to speak with the students today. We look forward to seeing you all again soon and wish you a pleasant rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay.